Hello and welcome back to the Paleocast Gaming Network and of course to the happiest place on earth which is my little Paleozoic Aquarium. However, something amazing and terrifying has happened which we need to talk about. I started recording this two days ago, then yesterday I went to the Natural History Museum in London, went to the collections, saw some great fossil fish, ate some lovely cake, it was really nice, I even got some cool inspiration for this place. But when I got back, I found that the mud had updated <laughs> and had like quadrupled its content, so um, holy hell, if we want to keep pace, we need to speed this up. And that process starts here. Behold, every single one of these crates contains at least one spawn egg for every group of creatures that are currently in the game, and as you can see, there are a lot of them. And we also have another time period to visit, so maybe we should quickly check this out first. So welcome to the Precambrian. <laughs> it's a little glitchy for some reason, not sure what that's about. But anyway, the Precambrian encompasses the earliest periods of Earth history, but considering it's like four billion years long, I'm not 100% sure which this bit is meant to represent, if that makes sense. The frozen sea and the snow kind of suggests we're maybe at the tail end of Snowball Earth, one of the maybe two or maybe more global ice ages that occurred at this time. We've also got these volcanic islands and lava everywhere, which is also pretty accurate. But then below the ice, we have the relatively younger, still incredibly ancient though, Ediacaran life, suggesting that this is kind of like a, a bit of a mashup, I guess, of different points of the Precambrian. Like this is Charnia, for instance, one of the oldest fossils that we know. It kind of looks like a fern, but it's actually a very, 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 very early animal. And it was discovered by like a schoolgirl in Leicester in the 50s, I want to say, um, here in England. And yeah, we'll talk more about these creatures. I'm sure at some point we'll, you know, put a few in the aquarium. But like I said, I really just want to hurry up and build some more aquarium tanks. But yeah, like I said, I think we should really just kind of get a shift on, to be honest. So to make this a little easier for ourselves, last time I said I wanted to try and put a bit of a behind the scenes type area back here, somewhere where I imagine the aquarium staff would use to sort of access the tanks and stuff like that. Well, in the Natural History Museum, I had this idea. So in most museum collections, you have these really long corridors of drawers. And, well, we've got all these boxes. Why don't just build a big corridor containing all the animals that we eventually intend to add? And that way we can kind of keep score of what we've done so far. Does that make sense? It's going to be a bit of a pain moving them, but I think it'll be worth it. God damn it, I capitalised Rayfins, but I didn't capitalise Catalogenous Fishes. Ugh. It's sort of odd, but I like it. I've tried to make it look a bit like uh, shelving, and then, yeah, each group has their own little spot. So we got invertebrate things on the left, and vertebrate things on the right, and then Tully Monster is sitting in the middle for now, bless it. Um, yeah, I like this. Okay, it's done, kind of. Um, obviously there's a huge gap here, but we've got the collection and then down here a sort of living space for our character, like an office space I guess. Got our kitchen and beds and a little window to the Ammonites which just lined up perfectly, I couldn't resist. Um, and then over here we can create uh, name tags for the different animals, so if you want any specific animals to have a certain name post a comment and I'll see that it gets done. All right, quick little update for you. I'm building a very grand staircase up to this next area. As soon as I'm done, we'll start adding some new creatures. I'm not even sure where to start. Oh shoot, we have loads of new placoderms. Should we just throw them in the tank with Titanicthys? Yeah, that should be okay, right? They're, they'll get along. I'm pretty sure they're all marine placoderms. Yeah, let's do that. So remember, placoderms are armored fish and the first group of animals to acquire jaws. For the same group that includes Dunkleosteus, but remember this mod is too good for Dunkleosteus, so we've got some interesting, obscure examples to explore instead. First up is Chilinu, which is found in China and Vietnam, hence the different pronunciation. Chilinu lived in the very late Silurian, making it a very old placoderm, and therefore, potentially, one of the oldest jawed animals. But despite this, we still don't really know how jaws evolved, they just kind of appear in the fossil record out of nowhere, but th if there's any clues, it's probably going to be in this thing. Next up, we'll throw in Gemuin... Gemuin Dina? Oh my god, apologies for my terrible pronunciation. I've never actually had that said out loud before, I've always read it. Huh. Anyway, they're super weird too, just because to show how diverse placoderms truly were, you know, considering they're always just reduced to your Junkleosteus and whatnot. Um, looks like a bit of like a modern stingray or skate. It has these sort of wing-like pectoral fins, and oh my goodness, what is it doing? Is it burrowing? <gasps> That's so cute! 
cute. I had no idea it did that. That's just, that's just wonderful. Look at it go. Look at its little head. That's just wonderful. Oh, I love it. I have completely forgotten what I was saying. That is just too magical. Um, what the hell was I going to say? Oh, uh, yeah, the reason that it is able to be all kind of floaty floaty and sort of wiggly, which are scientific terms for... I don't know what I'm trying to say. Basically, rather than being locked inside a rigid, bony exoskeleton, instead it has this mosaic of smaller dermal plates called tesserae, making it a lot more flexible. And that's that's kind of cool. That's how it works. The burrowing completely took me off guard. That's amazing. Uh, we also have Campbellidus. Super weird with some weird little teeth. We have some amazing fossils of them from the Gogo Formation. So the Gogo Formation is what we call a... Lagerstadt. So, I guess we're going to come back to this at some point in the future, so we'll quickly run through it now. A Lagerstadt is basically a location where fossils are found in either exceptionally high numbers and or are exceptionally complete, basically. Basically, it's a place where you get really good, well-preserved fossils. We've mentioned heaps before that the fossil record favours hard parts, but sometimes the environment is just right to preserve soft tissue as well, and the Gogo Formation is one of those environments. The conditions are just ideal. And yeah, we have some really awesome fish from that site, including a fossil fish embryo that is still attached to its parent by an umbilical cord. And yeah, there's a really nice 3D fossil of Campylidus that was found there. And finally, we have Cocosteus. Again, I have probably butchered the pronunciation. I'm realizing now for the first time that I've never said these names out loud. Now, if you've ever seen paleo art or a toy or anything of Duncleosteus, you probably notice that they're always recreated with this certain tail. We do not know what Dunkleosteus's tail looked like. There has been no fossil record of Dunkleosteus's entire body. We just have its skull. However, Cacosteus, which is a very close relative of Dunkleosteus, does have complete fossils of its body. And this is what inspired that shape. That's where that tail idea sort of comes from, if that makes sense. Um, which is actually kind of weird because I think these are pretty cute <laughs> compared to the horror show that is Nucleosteus. But yeah, that's kind of the most interesting thing about them, to be honest. They tell us a lot about what other placoderms may have looked like. I have had an idea. <laughs> Imagine a huge tank in here, but not like just all water, like a almost like a cavern with like trees and plants, like a kind of swamp, and a big pond at the bottom. And then like a staircase going like up here. So then like a little staff only sign here for the collections and stuff. But then this way, this is where we'll put the sharks, I think, the cartilaginous fishes. As you can see, my plans are slowly coming together. I'm imagining there'd be other places to sort of look in down here. And I'm starting our first shark tank and I have a really good idea on how to do it. And then finally, big shark tank in here. So this tank houses a very odd cartilaginous fish. Uh, it's called a Xenacanthus. And it's a very strange freshwater cartilaginous fish. Now I don't remember like where I've seen this. I've definitely seen artwork of this fish in like a flooded forest. I'm not sure if it's ever been found alongside petrified wood or something, but I've got this idea in my head. I want to try and recreate it. So I'm making the wood in the water like slightly darker. That's that's proper detail right there. There we go. That's what I was kind of talking about. Just like that. That's great. And this is what Xenacanthus looked like. It lived well for ages from the Devonian all the way up till the Triassic um, it's very weird doesn't look very shark like there's no uh, triangular dorsal fin to go down and out the water with instead the fin runs along the length of the body which this one was showing off really well until it moved plus you have these cute little spines on their heads as well very cool and then yeah marine tank on that side that's what we'll do next man I'm loving this so much